welcome back to episode two of this five part web series with the Traverse Theatre called How to Build Your Voice with me, Laurie Motherwell. And thanks for coming back. It's nice to see you all here. Um, I hope you found last week interesting. I asked you to look at your own work and have a look at those different elements of your own voice and the work that you want to make and for other people to see. I was interested, did you find it painful? Um, was it useful? Um, well, how, how easy was it? Was it quite quick? Did you quite quickly recognise those different parts and, and realise something new about yourself? Hopefully, which will be good moving forward. Now, I want you to quickly remind yourself about those. And to do that, we're going to go straight into our first exercise, which is just a super short one, just a couple of minutes for this, where I want you to look through those notes. And I want you to think that if someone asked you what were the three common elements in your work, what would they be? So a couple of minutes to have a think of that. So that's what the three common elements of uh, what were in your work. So your voice helps you stand out from the crowd. And as I said before, it's what will instantly jump out to readers and audiences of your work. It's hopefully it means that it can be recognizable as a that is insert your name here type of play, which would be great because it means that people know what to expect. It also means that people are, can engage with your narratives easily and it's accessible as well. I think there's so much pressure on writers right now to be a really original and have cut and have a cutting edge sort of element to the work or the, the voice of that artist, which I don't necessarily think has to be completely true. I think that if you are distinct because you're writing for your unique brain, that is in itself enough to have someone engage with your work, act, actively engage. Now, we will talk more about that, I think, in the next episode. But, I, but it's just, again, writing for yourself, and that's what will bring people into your work. And I always, and I kind of put my hand up for this, feel a bit, a bit jealous of other writers who I see a very distinct and imaginative and, and kind of brilliant voice. And, and, those, and you want to seek those writers out because you want to see that work, but you do have a kind of a wee bit, you're like, God, I wish you could do that. But remember that 
what you're writing, the way you see things might not be so original to you, but to other people looking in, it's something that they do not the way that they see things. So you want to keep playing with that, building on that, leaning into it so that you, because then eventually your work will be seen in the same way that you see other people's work. Really just be you on the page. I think that's the important thing. And it's a big part of that is learning not to be so afraid of criticism and that's from yourself and from others. So how do I get over self-criticism? And I'm hoping that maybe there's someone out there who will find this helpful and interesting. I, so I find it's sometimes quite hard, especially with self-criticism. I'm probably my biggest critic when it comes to my work. Um, but you, I guess it's just about that, you training yourself to let go. I think criticism is always going to be hard, but having that ability to take a step back from your work. And I do have ways to protect myself, which I wanted to share with you to see if it would help. So, because you need to take feedback from people, that's going to be an inevitable part of that. And it, because it's your voice, it feels very, very personal. But trying to remove that personal aspect aside and criticism is super helpful. But what did I do? I submit my work to people that I trust and who know my writing. So there are certain people who I've sent every play of mine to. They know how I write and they know how I would like to hear feedback and that is invaluable. And I think you can, most writers from the from the top to the bottom, have all got their little group of trusted readers. And when you fit and you share work with them, that's super useful. There's organizations that offer good, like will have good reading services and they will give you feedback. That can be a bit raw, I think, because it's coming from people that you don't necessarily know, you can't have a discussion with, you can't interrogate. And there are other organizations that will offer you an opportunity to have that relationship. If you're offered a relationship with that, brilliant. If it's someone who is honest, open, but also can be quite caring about the work or nurturing, that's great. Um, I would say take things that have come in a bit anonymously with a wee bit, pinch of salt, unless you can have a further discussion about it. But that's about also strength and knowing what you want to do. It's a, it's a balance, a real balance there. But I always... First thing I do is submit to pe people I trust. That I mean, and but there's also other elements of that as well. Don't hold on to the work too hard, I guess, or too long. Don't be too precious about the work itself unless you really, really believe in what you're trying to do and say. And I say that obviously to Prince of Salt because you have to let go of the work sometimes as well. And you can know to let go of things when you know it's not ready to, um, because it might take you in a direction that you never quite expected it to go, which has happened to me when you can give something and suddenly it's like, whoa, you totally said something that is going to change a lot of elements. But you're doing it in your, you need to remember to always do it in your vocabulary, your voice, the way you perceive things. And that's obviously so important. Now, Another way I try to protect myself is through my drafting process itself, which is, I think, quite common where you have a dump draft. So in my case, I call my first drafts, um, not even first drafts, my, my dump, my rubbish, absolutely nothing, 0 0.1s, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. So every time there's minimal changes, that's a point. And then by the time I get to that first draft, that's one. And if what that also does, though, is... I try not let it, don't, I don't let it become too on because there's obviously lots of different bits, but you can see a progression and suddenly before you know it, you've actually got a, quite a full, you know, a, a, you can see the, all the different lines, different changes that are going on through 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, but by then you're going to have that big meaty, hopefully, with some good stuff in it that you can mine away at and that's when you you can start changing and adding things, which is really useful. Um I always call it the burn draft, I guess, or the draft the draft zero. And I also know some other writers who do also write a full draft and just put everything into it and then put it in the bin 
and start again. And the good things are the ones that will, will stay out, which is extremely, <laughs> it's not something I would do, but you know, if it gets you to write, then that's worth it. But everyone has their own process. And I've never quite believed any uh, playwright who says that they have a play that they have, they did in the first, that's the first draft. And that is the thing, the thing we're seeing. I don't quite believe it because they've been just the kind of that idea has been germinating for a long time and there'll be bits and the pieces put together and stuff and, and also I don't find it very helpful because I don't I don't think it's great because I think most of the time we are constantly redrafting and doing things and so um, it's a process just stay with yourself be you while you're going through it and I think you'll get on great so theatre is a visual medium now, there's a visual language that we are seeing and that you have to show in what you're presenting on the page. So I had an idea for this, which was to think of your play as a picture. Now, your voice being the thing that is painting. It could be the, the paintbrush, I guess, or I mean, unless you wanted to use other alternative forms of painting. <laughs> But what are the colours of it? The texture which is of the story. The how thick are the lines? How methodically have you put that picture upon the canvas? Um, how rushed is it? How broad are the colours? The sweeping sort of statements that kind of kind of burst through. Is it on canvas or wood on a brick wall? How can we translate that visual kind of metaphor into thinking about voice? And I think that using that as an element of play within your work could be really useful and fun. For me, I think colour would certainly be mood, which is a very kind of easy connection between the two. Um, texture could be it's, it's the the way the lines work for me that would be language I think the, the texture the textural elements the, 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 the how language contributes to feeling how thick are the lines of archetypal characters is a very easy way of doing that how methodical the, the use of language can be specific but at the same time can appear Rushed. I mean, something like a writer like uh, Carl Churchill has a, an incredible specificity of language. It's 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 um, very unique, I believe, in the way that languages, words are used. There are lots, probably lots of other writers do, but that's the first name that comes to my mind. Now, I just want you to think about your work when you're presenting it on the page as a picture, and how that translates. You know, your voice can be translated into that. Now. We will be looking at scripts later on and the presentation of scripts. I think that's the fourth episode. But I just want you to, to think about the stage from your page, the player from the page onto the stage and how it appears in the picture and the elements that you can use to create that picture within the script. Now, how can we keep playing? How can we do that? By just writing. By writing that and playing with the, the way the form, how you present stuff, we'll, we'll do that. And a big part of that as well is having it spoken by others. It's very easy for us, I believe, to write something in our voice. And it makes total sense to us and, and, you can, and you can see it. But you, you really need other people to understand it as well and catch it. Now, read it out loud is good for that, but also having people read it and if there's opportunities to do that then that's great especially if you're in a kind of safe environment to really think about the work and develop and I think that's super useful. Next time you want to make changes I think it's important to maybe break down what those changes are to little little focuses little things that you can do so that you can concentrate on one part at a time and develop that part and that's where my little 0 0.1, 0 0.2s come into play. 
You don't have to do it all once because I think we find it disheartening when you can try to make all these broad changes and you're looking at a script and you're realizing that isn't quite working. So I'd say break it down so you can be looking into that in, in little kind of micro ways and that's time consuming, but it does really help. Um, so and by developing, by keep writing is such a big thing. So keep mining for stories that you want to tell. And if you have a distinct use of language, then go for it, dig in. Really try to further de develop yourself and your voice in the way that you tell stories. And you are within your own voice also a collection of other people as well and other experiences. So just sort of have a think about what is and you can bring other people in as well. And you can have your main voice and then you can start to layer other stuff on it as well. Now, I've got a wee, another writing exercise. This one's going to take quite a wee bit longer, um, but I think it will be super, super useful. I want you to write, it doesn't have to be a full scene, but an, a kind of a standard two a character. That doesn't mean the characters can't be abstract, abstract in anything, but two characters, an A and a B. And B has a secret that A wants to find out. That's the premise of your piece of writing. So a B, A, A, B kind of structure. But what I want you to do is don't let it spiral on. I just want you to take it to where it stops. Maybe B gives up their secret. Who knows? Maybe they don't. But what I want you to do is take into consideration what you found out at the end of last episode and what we talked about at the top of this episode, which was about what your voice is and the common things, the noticeable things. I want you to use that in creating a scene. So that's B has a secret the A wants to find out. And I want you to have a think about your own voice and use those things in it. And I just want your voice to shine in this really simple and common setup for a piece of writing. All right, I'll see you in a wee while.
So I wanted to take a moment to talk about the difference between story and plot. Now, story is the basic narrative outline about your character, where they're going, what they're doing. But plot is the way that narrative is structured, organised and presented. I think it's quite useful to, to think of that as a way to really kind of get into the nitty gritty of what you're doing or how you, how you can do what you want to do um, in your work. Now, there are seven sort of building blocks to plot. There's choice, which is what you're choosing to show in your script and in your work. So what instance we see, what characters we see, um, the, the, the scenes that we see, anything you choose, that's your choice. There's the sequence. So that is the order that you're putting these incidents or scenes, how, where you're putting them and how that builds up your story and how it's then received. There's the rhythm. And that's simply how, how you put the scenes together um, and how do they can how they kind of come together and are they, are they quick are they slow is it is drawn out and that will create a, a, a rhythm to your piece now progression is how the the story moves and how you how you're building how you're actively sort of building your story up then there's duration which is how long we're actually there how long are we seeing something on the stage which is also linked into the next one which is Tempo, which is the number of uh, units of action that we are seeing. Now, for example, with Chekhov, the, the, the units of action is very slow. It's, um, there isn't a huge amount number of, there's not a huge amount of, of units of action. So we're kind of there watching everything very kind of slowly on that, whereas that could be compared with someone like Sarah Kane, who's again, a very distinct voice, I would argue, modern voice, but it's very quick. Rapid, rapid, rapid units of action. Um, so that would be your tempo. And finally, last, we have genre. Now, genre is something that we are going to talk about more in the next episode because I think that there's something about that that's really helpful and it's a really interesting connection to voice and how we can use a voice in our own sport. So we'll talk about genre, I think, in the, it's the next episode. But So before we get there, um, the dramatic, just to think about how a dramatic shape of a story has a large impact on how audiences interpret meaning. Now, your, your, your kind of building blocks of plot are a really big part of that. And it's, it can also be, as I kind of said earlier, that these are, you know, quite interesting ways of looking at how your voice is working. And you can kind of you can take a kind of scientific look at that, and that's your craft. That's I guess the craft of the writer, that you can start to use those to very succinctly understand how your work is connecting with others and how it engages with other people, and that how you can build up the cause and effect of things happening within the story. Now that's not just story elements, but also the things you're doing and how they're having an effect on others. So. We want to think about the, how the cumulative effect of all these things will then bring us to what is the inevitable ending of your stories. Now, I've got a wee, another wee exercise. I should only take a few minutes for this one, I think. But it is just quite simple. I want you to outline the plot, not to write the whole thing. Just outline the plot for the life of one of your most treasured possessions. So I want you to plot up till the present day, till now, and I just want you to write down the plot of what that would be.
great. Now that you've done that, it's just kind of a little short thing. I wanted you just to kind of have a wee kind of use your imagination, have a wee bit of fun with it. But I would quite like you to have just a look at that and try and take yourself away from it and see it from the outside and just consider the choices that you've made, the things that you've found important in the plot of that, of, the, of that, ob I presume, object um, or maybe pet, and just think of what it is you've chosen to highlight. And I think that kind of can inform something about the choices we make and, and the use of our, our voice. It was just something for a wee bit of fun. But I want you to think of the um, deviations of dramaturgy. So how we can use um, deviations from our, our usual ways of working to also to our advantage within your own voice. So how you can cr create opposition and broaden out from any sort of uh, limitations that you might have. So there's certain ways, that, there are certain things that you can also think of and not just plot that you can maybe change, just little elements to kind of um, spark up some new, new things. And I think that they could be quite useful. So one of those is uh, deviations from mimesis, which is uh, just uh, breaking the fourth wall, being theatrical. Uh, you want to like, bring things in front of people in new ways uh, or confronting them directly or direct address, uh, which is something that uh, writers like, um, I guess, David Gregg would have done it, I think, in Potential Heart and, and some other piece of work, or, or, or Brecht, for example, love breaking the fourth wall, and that's a very Brechtian thing. It's essentially named after him. So using elements like that can, can is a way to maybe take your voice in a different direction, as in still using that voice, but doing something a little bit different. Deviations from place and from uh, the, the temporal anywhere. So taking yourself to a new area, a new time, which doesn't have to be grounded in this world, but something else. And using time in different ways, if you can find a way to do that and use your voice within that, that's a way of, again, bringing a new element into your work. Um, deviations of wants of action, so an unconventional plot, so an un unconventional kind of narratives, I guess. So, um, I mean, Beckett like, has done a lot of that, I guess, and where we don't, where want is kind of removed and we end up in maybe kind of being a circular element. So removing one, but it's, it's, which is going to be difficult within kind of linear narratives to be able to do things like that and project and, and build story. That's certainly, I would say, something more to, more akin to playing with language. But if that's your thing, that's what you want to do, then fair enough. Deviations in dialogue. So changing the way that people uh, talk, um, which we are, we're going to do an exercise on uh, in our next episode, if you do come to join us. And uh, deviation in time, that could, that again, which I think I'd already mentioned, but you could also use... I would say in the time that you're spending, not only on the stage, but perhaps the time that we're spending with an audience as well and with a reader. Um, now, that's kind of the end uh, for this episode. And I hope that, you know, looking at plot, I find it very helpful because the way those, that, that kind of, the smaller sort of look at, like looking at and that can zoom in kind of way can be really helpful to figure out what your work is actually doing. You know how people are reacting to it, but how is it working? What, what exactly is your work doing specifically that is causing the the feelings and the, the, the effect it's having on audiences? And I'd like you just have a think about that. I'm not setting any exercise or anything for that, but just look at your work again, using what we've spoken about today, and just go, what is it I'm doing there? Why, why is it that those things are having the effect that it has having on people. Like, for example, if scenes are running into very quickly, if it's causing like a kind of chaotic effect, what exactly is it that is doing that? And and how is it doing that? And maybe think about deviating away from that, or those things, so you can use your voice in a different way. As I said, I think the next episode we're going to talk about genre, um, which should be really interesting. So I hope you join me again and I'll uh, see you soon.